You're listening to For the Republic, a love letter to Star Wars animation. Hello everyone and welcome to a very special edition of For the Republic. Today we are here to discuss the new Star Wars novel Queen's Hope by E.K. Johnston. This is the third in E.K. Johnston's Padme trilogy of books. And this one had a lot of hype and attention surrounding it because it was going to be focused on Padme and Anakin's relationship at the dawn of the Clone Wars Pretty much right at the end of Attack of the Clones. And I am not alone. I am here with a very special guest today. Joining me today is David, also known as the Star Wars Historian. How are you, David? I'm great, Andrew. Thank you so much for, for having me on. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, and so it's an honor to be to be on. Yeah, you were one of the first people to tweet out uh, how much you enjoyed the first couple episodes, which I, I know all of us really appreciated those tweets and it, it meant a lot to us for us trying to get this podcast going and trying to get something special started so I, I it just I cannot tell you how much that meant to us and uh the four of us definitely want to have you on the main show at some point in the future as well but I am very excited to have you here uh to discuss this book yeah absolutely so real quick before we get into the book itself one thing I like to do with every new guest that I have on this show is if you have a first memory that you have with Star Wars or if you have a story about how you were introduced and became a fan of the series because I also like talking about our personal connections to the franchise so if you if you have any stories like that feel free to share them before we get into the book because I like to I like to get to know everyone that I have on this show and I like to know why they love the same franchise that we all do because everyone has a different story. Yeah, that's right. And for me, it, it basically, I don't want to say it started at birth, but it, it kind of was that situation to where my dad told a story of how I'm a twin. So my brother's name is Daniel. So shout out to him. Uh, but we grew up with the original trilogy on, you know, the, the VCR. And my dad keeps telling me about how I would have trouble sleeping at night. And so he would take me out of my crib and he would sit down with me and we would watch Star Wars from a very young age. So I think I've always been a Star Wars fan, uh, but it wasn't until I got into college with my roommate, Luke, that I, my love for Star Wars really started to come out even more and more. And even after college, I, that's when I really started reading star wars books and i've read since 2021 i've read about 25 books so far wow uh within the canon and so it's been it's been a lot of star wars content to digest uh but what people don't realize is just how how much world building and how incredible the books really make the star wars universe and, and i would encourage people if, if you haven't really given the books a chance you need to because they're great Oh, I very much agree. They are such a great source of interesting storytelling for the franchise. Yes. And not only have they done a great job at like enhancing other material that we've had, but especially with the High Republic itself, getting this own little like sandbox of storytelling has been really nice. And I have just, mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how much I've enjoyed like fully immersing myself in the high republic books and even though i'm still oh, for very sure very behind at this point i'm still about a wave behind because i mm -hmm. have not gotten to fallen star or anything like that even though i i know pretty much everything unfortunately uh it <laughs> oh, is no. yeah I'm sorry no, about I'm, that <laughs> that one it still hurts but there's <laughs> so many great stories out there and i've also mm -hmm. my first canon novel i read was lords of the sith back in 2015 uh which wow. is a, a yeah. great one but i am that... <laughs> what i call a slow reader so mm -hmm. and i i need to be in a very specific mood to sit down and read a book because i have a yeah admittedly i have quite a short attention span so i can't just be like okay i'm gonna read three books this week like that just cannot happen but i've been trying mm -hmm. to read more and more this year especially because it I've noticed it, it helps calm me and then just getting these Star Wars stories is 
been really great, especially been immersing myself in the High Republic. I've been trying to finish as fast as I can. But I needed to take a yeah. break from my High Republic binge for two books, one being Brotherhood, which just dropped, which I am about one yes. chapter into right now. And that was very good. And then the other one being Queen's Hope, because I have always mm-hmm. been a huge Padme fan. The excerpts that uh, they released really intrigued me. I, I know E.K. Johnston tends to have a bit of a, a mixed reception amongst the Star Wars fandom. Uh, but for me personally, there were areas where this book was a little on the uh, the weak side for me. But overall, I had a decent time with it. And I cannot wait to get into a lot of the stuff. Obviously, we'll be talking spoilers here. We're going to be doing a big discussion of everything we liked about the novel, everything that worked for us, the big themes, some criticisms. But we're just going to be sharing our thoughts on the book. So for you, I'm assuming that you have read the entirety of the Queen's Trilogy. What have been your overall thoughts on this trilogy as a whole? And and how do you feel like this has either increased your enjoyment of Padme as a character or maybe, I don't know, it was a detriment depending on your thoughts what are your what are your thoughts on this? Um, I have my own, but I just want to get yours first. Yeah, so for me, these books enhanced uh, Padme's, I think, overall character. I mean, when we really look at you know the films, it's really kind of hard to to give a fair critique of Padme Amidala because we only see her for a little bit. I mean, we see her a lot in the Phantom Menace. We see her a lot in attack of the clones and we get a snippet of her in revenge of the sith and so we don't really have a character that is fleshed out and i remember that before i got into these books i just always like padme whenever she's a queen she always talks so weird and her voice is just kind of flat all the time but when you get into these books it explains why there's a reason why she speaks the way she does it's in their culture it's kind of her showing her calm, her power, her patience, her demeanor as a queen. And so I think these books, what they've done is that it's really explained and fleshed out her character in such a way that when you come away from these books, I mean, say what you will about E.K. Johnston and her writing, I will say personally, she's she's not my favorite. Uh, and I think especially if you try and compare her to like a Claudia Gray, a Kevin Scott, a Charles Soule, her writing is just different and so you really have to kind of look you really have to look at her writing separately from them and when you do that you realize just how well ek johnston fleshes out padme's character so i would say that these books have really helped her in terms of putting more of her characteristics and who she is on display for for everyone to see Yes, I will agree with you there. I think one thing I really enjoy about how E.K. writes Padme as a character is how she distinguishes, like, the different forms of who Padme Mm -hmm. is, especially in this book. Like, they often mention, especially during conversations with her and Sabe, of the senator Padme and then the queen and then the real Padme. And Mm -hmm. there are very specific moments where to add to conversations, they will, EK will uh, claim that Padme will switch like instinctively mm-hmm. from one mode to the other. And I think having that distinguishing aspects was a really like interesting narrative choice. And I, I also liked mm-hmm. getting that glimpse into who she is because like you said, in the Phantom Menace, I really love her as the queen, but she speaks in this very regal you know, formal mm-hmm. tone. Whereas we see her more real personality when she's in disguise on Naboo. And then that's really what we see her as for the rest of the prequels. But we do have this regal queen public persona that she has that EK fleshes out more. And especially with the handmaidens, having them all have the persona of Amidala. And I think EK does a yeah. great job in that. And also fleshing out each of the handmaidens to make them their own character. Uh, We'll get to what they do in this book, but I I, I enjoyed it. Now, admittedly, 
I don't know if you saw my tweet or not. Admittedly, I went into this book not reading the whole trilogy. I read the first right. half of Queen Shadow when it first came out, enjoyed it, but mm-hmm. never got around to finishing it. So yeah. as a result, I, I didn't get to Queen's Peril, but I read Queen's Hope standalone because the excerpts really made it seem like it would be more on its own, more connected to more of the Clone Wars and just being like Padme and Anakin going on their own adventure before they get married. Mm-hmm. And the book That's right. was not that. It was that for a bit, but then it divulges. For a little bit, yeah. It, then it divulges into Padme goes on her own adventure and then it really is a lot of Sabe's story because she has to once again impersonate mm-hmm. Padme. But it's in the Senate this time, so it's a bit different and it, it's not surrounded by the the makeup and the costumes of Amidala. So it, mm-hmm. it was a bit of a different story there. And then we saw a little bit of Anakin uh, at the beginning of the Clone Wars, not yet a general, still fighting with Obi-Wan. That was really interesting. Mm-hmm. And I, I, the one thing that I think the book does great is... I think the way that this and Brotherhood have come out within a month of each other is perfect timing. Because I feel like these two as companion reads are going to be great. And I have not finished Brotherhood yet, but the fact Mm -hmm. that they take place during the same time and tell stories of Anakin early in his journey in the Clone Wars and also uh, Padme's side of the beginning of the war... I, I think it's a, a great one-two punch, a great companion piece to read. And I don't think it's a, a coincidence that they really said like that. I know this book was supposed to come out last year and then it got delayed. November. Yes. Yeah. But I do not think – I actually think that this was the better idea because having it come out right before Brotherhood and then also right before the Obi-Wan series is going to end up being better off in hindsight, I believe. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So I'm about, there's 55 chapters in Brotherhood. I'm on, I think, chapter 48 right now. So I'm almost done with it. You're almost done. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I was and shocked how I absolutely, big that book was when I when it first came uh, out. I was like, whoa, this is going to take me a minute. Yeah. And, and so I guess just a little bit about how my reading process. So I, I read the physical copies, but also if I'm off doing something like I'm running an errand, I have the audiobook as well. And so I'm kind of like listening. So am I, if I'm washing dishes or I'm mowing the lawn, like I'm listening to the book and just actively p- trying to pay attention and kind of see the galaxy in my head. And so that's been very helpful for me in, in trying to kind of keep up with the books because if audiobooks weren't a thing and Star Wars has high quality audiobooks even if they're not you know the like script books like tempest runner which is amazing uh they their non-script audiobooks are just as good with the music and with with uh the narrator doing voices and stuff so it's really incredible but i agree with the queen's hope and brotherhood they overlap a little bit uh, and especially as you get more into the book, you see Padme, Anakin's relationship, how Obi-Wan kind of fits into that. And I, a Queen's Hope is different than what I thought it was going to be. Like you, I thought I was also going to be more focused on Anakin and Padme, but Sabe really is the star of this book. And and she is kind of also the, the star in Queen's Peril as well. Um, and And I enjoyed that. That was a good thing that was different than what I was expecting. Sometimes our expectations needs to be crushed for something better to come along. And I think EK does an amazing job in making sure that happens throughout this book. Yeah, I'll agree with you there. I think it being not what we expected is not necessarily a bad thing. It just kind of affected my own enjoyment of the book because I didn't have Mm -hmm. the other two books to enhance my opinion i feel like if i had queen's peril in my memory i would have enjoyed a lot more because they do reference a lot of elements from the first two books and what i will say is this book does a very good job at making it very easy to follow along like i i know each of the handmaidens i know a brief description of of who they are as characters because of that bit of queen Mm -hmm. shadow that i did read and then other events like uh sache's story when she's with uh, Harley Jafon. Yes. He did a very good job at 
catching you up to speed very quick if say you didn't mm-hmm. read queen's peril because i feel like because <laughs> yeah uh people it, it was promoted in such a way that that was a very strong possibility that people would just read mm-hmm. this one because it's a clone wars story as opposed to a prequel to phantom menace like queen's peril was but what i will say is and i think this comes down to one of my weaknesses is i i thought sabe had a very strong story but mm-hmm. every other handmaiden I thought took a big backseat in this book. And... Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I I enjoyed Sasha's story, you know, of her trying to figure out the treaty with Harley and, and all of that. I thought that was great. But for the most of them, they were mentioned and they got maybe a second or two of book time. They They really did. It seemed like this story was now focusing on Padme and Sabe instead of the handmaidens like we were introduced to in the other two books. I I agree with that, definitely. I mean, I liked Sasha's story. My critique with it, though, is once it kind of resolves, quote unquote, and I really didn't even feel like it did, it just stops dead for the rest of the book. So, like, you have 10 or 12 Mm -hmm. chapters, I think where Sasha is just just done. It's not in the book at all. And it just becomes That's right. all of Padme's story and then the ending bit with Sabe, which I thought really worked. Mm-hmm. But if you had these three or four concurrent stories and then one of them just ends with about a third of the book left and is not brought mm-hmm. up at all pretty much until that point, I did think it was a bit distracting and I was like, Oh, what, what's going mm-hmm. on with Sasha? Like we just, <laughs> came, they yeah. came to this political resolution and then it's like, all right, that's it. That was it. And that was it. I was like, okay, I, I don't, I don't know. This didn't work. That was my other thing <laughs> is I really loved the scene with Anakin and Obi-Wan's clones where we got introduced to sister. I thought that was such a standout scene and say what you will about EK's, uh, lgbtq representation there's a lot of it whether or not it's good representation we can argue Mm -hmm. because to me it definitely feels like oh let's just have oh this character uses these pronouns all of a sudden and it's it's good and it's nice to see but to me it comes off a bit hollow at points if you know what i mean like sashi's it definitely assistant i was just like yeah this character I feel like EK was like, all right, well, how can I come up with someone that uses these specific gender fluid pronouns? Oh, here we go. Random mm-hmm. assistant character. Uh, the fact yeah. that they don't even have a Wikipedia article was shocking to me. Because <laughs> everyone yeah. has a Wikipedia article. Everyone does. Teppo, I believe, was their name. Did not. And it's not to say that it was mm-hmm. a bad. they were a bad character. But it definitely did feel like, okay... We got to check a box here. That being said, sister's scene really worked for me. It was very powerful. I think it was a mm-hmm. very smart idea to have that be one of the things that they released beforehand to get people talking. Yeah. And I I mm-hmm. just love the concept of a trans clone and how that they were how sister got her name of right. this is how my brothers make me feel like I belong. I was like, "Okay, I love that." And, and the conversation that she had with Anakin was one of my favorite scenes in mm-hmm. the whole novel. Uh, yeah. I thought EK's way of writing the clones to me very much worked. Not only with Sister, but also Styx, the commander that Padme worked with on her incognito mission. I really yeah. enjoyed him as a character. I think EK very much... I, I liked the way she wrote clones. And I also liked the way mm-hmm. that she wrote uh, Palpatine. Because a couple of sections of the book take place from his persona and his point of view which i thought was very interesting because i i don't believe we've seen that much at all in any of these canon novels of seeing things from chief palpatine's perspective and seeing him react in real time to this war and these events that he's manipulating himself there was a very Mm -hmm. strong moment near the end of the book when padme comes to this agreement with these Nemoidians who are trying to go against the Trade Federation that ends up being one of the big reveals of the book is the contact that hired Padme to go on this undercover mission ends up being a Nemoidian that wants to go against 
Newt Gunray and take Lot Dodd's seat in the Senate. And I'm like, please, mm-hmm. d- take his seat. I, Lot Dodd <laughs> can just go away, yeah. please. Yes, but I the, I remember the second episode uh, where you guys were just calling for his head. I was, which I was, I was just like, I don't, I don't disagree with you. Don started yes. it for me, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, thank you for doing the Lord's work for me. But then we see uh, Bail Organa and Mon Mothma and Padme bring this to the Chancellor's attention because Palpatine mm-hmm. ended up being there, un- uh, unannounced, unplanned. And we get that small portion of the chapter from Palpatine's perspective of him just mm-hmm. losing his mind and his plans of, I'll let them do this for now, but I'm going to make sure he suffers in the long run. You really get to see, like, under the mask of Palpatine's public chancellor persona and then actually right. seeing Dark Sidious's thoughts in real time, I thought was great. We see a bit of it in the Clone Wars, but like actually getting to see his real thoughts during this, mm-hmm. I thought worked tremendously. And that was one thing that I was very much surprised of how I thought EK got Palpatine's character and how mm-hmm. she really made him out to be this puppet master and evil Dark Lord of the Sith disguised as this kindly Chancellor that we know him to be, but actually getting mm-hmm. to see all these thoughts are running through his mind. I really enjoyed the the couple chapters that we got from Palpatine's perspective. And it was a nice surprise because I wasn't expecting it. Yeah. And I, uh, everything you just said, again, just again, highlights how closely connected a queen's hope is to brotherhood. Um, because if you like the introduction of sister in this book, Ooh. brotherhood's going to be good for you. I'm just going to drop that. There we drop go. that a little. Bit I there. know Mike Chen um, said that he collaborated with EK Johnston a lot with the writing of brotherhood. Yes. So it's, uh-huh. it's making a lot more sense now. So yes, I and even so and even seeing that book. Palpatine and the bro- brotherhood again, you kind of get we get to see in his mind, probably not in brotherhood as much as in Queen's hope, but you get that sense of Palpatine's the one in the back, pulling all the strings, making everything kind of happen, especially in the Queen's hope. I I just loved it when after Padme, Bale and Mon Mothma came and said, Hey, this is what's going down. We have this scene with him where he's just like, Hmm, should I, should I go ahead and mess this up? Or should I wait? And he's like, let me wait. Let me use this to my advantage. And E.K. Johnston just shows her ability to, again, flesh out not just Padme's character, but other characters as well. And her work with the clones, like you said, was brilliant. And and yeah, I mean, I guess we could say with with the assistant, maybe it was a little, I don't want to say forced, but it just her her identity just kind of wasn't as organic it it seemed like hey let's just let's make let's make this happen uh, just to make it happen yeah but i, I think sisters I was hate using the term forced diversity i think it can come off very right. toxic and it can lead yeah. to a bunch of conversations i just have no interest in being a part of but there definitely is mm-hmm. representation for the sake of representation and I feel like right. the assistant came yeah. into that area a mm-hmm. bit more than I was hoping for. Because I'm always about, mm-hmm. I want so much representation as we can get. Because uh, I, I think it's important and right. it matters. However, I feel like it was, their character was their gender identity first and foremost to me which I always mm-hmm. think is a narrative mistake when crafting queer characters is it okay their their character is uh they're gender fluid. All right, what else? Oh, that's it. I feel like that's yeah. where that character fell in the line, but with Sticks and with Sasha and Yane, I feel they are much better representation, which I really yes. much enjoyed. And Yes, and I agree. I agree with that 100%. I think it, it, it seemed 
well thought out in terms of let's let's use that uh, let's have this in our story in such a way that it represents well and it, it it's natural it comes across that way uh, and so i think even with these clone characters with the clone wars i was a little bit worried about how ek was going to do with this but if she's working with mike chin that helps out a lot and now now i'm starting to think that there like you said there's a reason why this book came out in april instead of november yeah i think i think the delay was was one thing but i think they figured out in the development process of just how much that these books will connect to each other and they made mm -hmm. the decision to do it that way which i think was a good point i just i don't have the the book in front of me right now but i needed to get the uh conversation between sister and anakin because it was one of my favorite parts of the book which was what's your name trooper and then sister says sister it's how my brothers tell everyone i belong and anakin says belonging is important and mm -hmm. that spoke so much to me uh i i just as, as someone who my youngest sibling is trans and my best friend growing up is also trans so this is something that is very important to me. And as someone that is bisexual myself, getting to see characters like this on screen and in these books, it was just, I, I loved it. And mm -hmm. I, I like how much the fandom has kind of gra gravitated to and embraced Sister as a character. And, mm -hmm. and I, I love that. And... Now that you mentioned that there's going to be some Brotherhood stuff, I remember EK saying that she created Sister so that the character can show up in other authors' works. What do you know? She wasn't kidding. Literally right off the bat. Yeah. Uh, hopefully that she wasn't. Hopefully that didn't ruin Brotherhood for anyone, but we didn't directly spoil any plot lines. We just talked about a character. Yeah, so of course I not. Feel like, I feel like we're going to be fine there. Uh, and I think people knew that these books were going to tackle very similar stories and another thing that they both mm -hmm. tackle is the depiction both galaxy wide and internally uh the the members of the republic's perceptions and discrimination towards uh nemoidians is a very much on screen because we get a when padme finds out that her contact is this nemoidian senator or wannabe senator Mm -hmm. She has that moment where she immediately has these very prejudiced thoughts come to her mind. And EK has a few scenes where she's like, Padme spoke in a way that was a lot harsher or, or ruder mm -hmm. and filled with prejudice that she was even, that she didn't even think she was capable of. So yeah. the way that they have these, these characters grapple with their own prejudices, and I know we do see that a lot in brotherhood as well mm -hmm. i really enjoyed and and it makes sense because the people of naboo have these issues whether they be valid or not for a reason because of the occupation and we know you know the stuff that sasha went through having being tortured and having her body filled with scars which made i, I thought immediately when i picked up queen shadow for the first time that immediately made me relate to her character and enjoy her character more is adding that depth to the occupation of Naboo, knowing that one of these handmaidens was literally tortured by the trade yes. federation. Yes. So getting to see their, their bias and their anger against the trade federation mm -hmm. and having to overcome that yeah. is, is a relatable thing. And we've seen that many a times in, in real life politics and, and getting that kind of influence in these Star Wars stories is always a mm -hmm. good thing. I mean, people try to throw out that Star Wars isn't a political, or at least wasn't until recently, a political franchise. I have very bad news for you. Uh, literally everything about Star Wars is political. George Lucas I mean, the... said that the Empire <laughs> is... Uh, space Nazis. Yeah, space Nazis, imperialism. He's comparing yeah. Palpatine in the prequels to Bush during the Iraq War. So, again, to say that these are not inherently political stories and political themes, the the the, the movie the the series is literally about the original trilogy is literally about a rebellion overcoming and going against an imperialist 
dictatorship regime. But no, that's mm-hmm. not political. Okay. Uh, well, of course not. No. I mean, why would it be when, I mean, we could just sweep it under the rug and pretend that it's just, I, I mean, people do this all the time with film, especially very recently. Like these, these films have always been trying to say something about the real world. And people can try to ignore that as much as possible. But then there comes to a point in time to where creators, content creators are just saying, no, enough's enough. This is what we're putting on the screen. So wait, you can't even ignore it. Uh, And people just, they're not huge fans of that. And I've never understood that. Um, I get it. Star Wars can be an escape world for, for us, but it doesn't mean that we can't still try to make a difference through content like this. The thing that bothers me about that is you say it's an escape world and I, it, it, it is an escape world for me, but why would adding more mm-hmm. minority characters hurt your escape world? That's where you have to have the question of, well, what does that say about you? And I mean, <laughs> view, yeah, uh, as opposed to everything else like that. That's always what I think when people point this stuff out. It's like, OK, well, why does that hurt your perfect escape world then? What is, right. What are you trying to say? here? Yeah, I don't under. Yeah, I don't understand that either. Uh, I know for me, this is an escape world only in the fact that it allows me to kind of not deal with the things that I'm dealing with. It, it, it It's a distraction for me. However, just because you bring in minority characters and add representation to it doesn't destroy that escape world. If only it, it makes it even more realistic in terms of what we get to experience. But for someone else to kind of be like, well, you know, bringing in more, I mean, because I'm a minority, I'm Hispanic and, and we don't really get a lot of, or I guess in the original trilogy, we really didn't get a lot of Hispanic kind of characters and we get to see a little bit more as time goes on. And for someone to say, that bothers me. I'm like, why? That doesn't make any sense. Like, why wouldn't we want to use, include everybody in this world that is complete fantasy, but still try to talk about real world issues? I just don't understand that and I don't get that. Um, But I think what we're seeing, especially in today's world, because of social media and and things of that nature, we're really starting to find out about who people really are. And it's not great. We can't. It's easier for us to actually express our real thoughts behind us like a screen. And it's a little scary sometimes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, judging well at least going by what i remember because i i've been in this fandom for quite a bit and i remember Mm -hmm. when rogue one and the force awakens first came out and i remember seeing posts from hispanic and latino fans of how much cassian and (laughs) poe meant to them because they were finally seeing themselves in these movies And, and that's the thing is like whether or not you enjoy the characters or not these characters mm-hmm. mean something to so many people that don't get to see themselves in these characters as much as you get to because you happen right. to be a straight white male. That's 95% mm-hmm. of uh, film and, and media characters. Uh, and it happened with uh, the MCU as well when they started having more female-led superhero movies. It's like, oh, come on, what is mm-hmm. this? It's like, do you know how many little girls have wanted this and get to finally see that especially with yeah uh, black panther was another big one and and that's the yeah. is like why i can never well hate on anything and, and that's another thing with sister is i know that that scene and this character have got i mean the world to so many trans star wars fans out there which is why i applaud ek johnston for creating the character and making her not just like you said representation for the sake of representation but Mm -hmm. a very uh, immediately lovable character yeah i mean and i think the most recent example of where we're seeing just kind of this criticism of minorities really being represented is even in the percy jackson disney plus series when you know they 
cast a a black girl as Annabeth Chase. And people are freaking out about that. And I'm like, why? This is awesome. This is great. Um, and so I, I, people are just, they love to complain. And we even see about Moses Ingram in yeah. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, the Lord of the like Rings She's already getting flack. Got a lot of it too. It's like, oh, there's yeah. no black people in the Tolkien universe. I'm like, what does that mean? First of all, yeah, I want you to yeah. repeat what you just said <laughs> and just think yeah. about, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this out loud out and loud. especially post it on the internet for hundreds of thousands of people to see because that's just, mm -mm. I, <laughs> that is just, it does not make me feel good at all. And it, yes. It, and the unfortunate truth is that they can hide behind the screen. Yeah. Because they, they, That's That's they the... feel that they are invincible. Uh, when, but if they're confronted about this in, in real life, I guarantee you their tune is going to be different. But mm -hmm. who knows? Uh, we went on a bit of a tangent there, but I think it was an important tangent <laughs> yep, <to> sorry. Have. <laughs> so I'm glad that we had that conversation. So we made our, our, our intentions clear here when talking clear. about these books and, and this universe of how important this stuff is which I will applaud mm -hmm. E.K. Johnston for very much for at least yes. pushing to constantly put this stuff in her stories because dozens of authors will not or they'll be too afraid to. Mm. But I feel like this new, especially recently with, I guess, this new era, if you want to call it, of Star Wars publishing, High Republic onwards and all these other books, I think is doing yeah. a much better job at mm -hmm. giving these characters some shine and some light and making them more compelling and making them fan favorite characters, which I, I really appreciate. And I think Lucasfilm publishing has been on a roll recently, whether or not Queen Soap is my absolute favorite of the novels I read. That doesn't matter to me. The fact that we're still yeah. getting mm -hmm. stories like this, I will forever be grateful. And I am so glad as a fan that I get to see these stories and I get to, read them and, and and enjoy them and whether it be a scene or a character that i really love and embrace that's very important to me the one thing that i have noticed at least through people that i've talked to about this book because i i did approach once you said you were game i was like okay so that's at least one person we can have for this but i approached a couple other people i was like hey mm -hmm. would you be interested in and in coming on and talking about queen's hope because i know you read it and a lot of the responses I got was, I would definitely, but I can't put my thoughts into words. It's like, I have thoughts, but I'm not exactly sure what they are. I don't know if I like the book. I don't know if I dislike the book. Yeah. And I don't want to say that that's a, a theme I see with EK's mm -hmm. novels. But I know at least a lot of people feel this way about Ahsoka and about some of these Padme books. Is like, they're good, but... I don't know if they necessarily have the staying power of, of, of sticking with you. And right. what really did work for me, and I will say this, my favorite part of the book was every couple of chapters, EK would write these interludes focusing on the important mm -hmm. women in this, the, the prequel, whether that be uh, Padme, Shmi Skywalker had some great ones, Baru, Lars had some great ones. Uh, we got a Breha Organa one to end the book, yes. which I pop yes. for. I'm like, yes, finally, <laughs> some more Breha yeah. Organa content, and which I, I really loved. I don't believe that at least they were definitely weren't in Queen's Shadow, but I, I don't believe that they were something that she included in Queen's Peril. But they were my favorite parts of the novel. I, I know a big portion of these books have been about Padme and the other handmaidens quest to end slavery throughout the gal the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And that's part of Sasha's story, that's part of Sabe's story in this book. And we get to see more of Shmi Skywalker as a character. We get to see that Baru was a part of this organization that was trying to free slaves and create this technology that Shmi was an inventor like her son, which I cannot tell you how much that made me smile. Those Shmi Skywalker <laughs> stories. Uh, yeah. Like like mother, like son. And I, again, I will say this again. 
then you're really gonna enjoy really brotherhood gonna enjoy brotherhood <laughs> yes it's it's almost like this was meant to happen then uh yes so what i'm hearing is i need to finish this book now um <laughs> i am it's so it's excited. a fantastic book that so really excited. really compliments this brotherhood is what makes i think queen's hope a book that people should pick up i mean pick it up anyway uh, I think it's a it's a good book. I I think E. K. Johnston is just she's an interesting writer, and I don't think that she's everybody's cup of tea. Um, because I read Ahsoka, I think just I think with Ahsoka, and I also think with the Padme trilogy. For me, this this is just me. I just wish I had more. I agree with book. that. I, I feel um, like this one, not only... It was a quick read, and it was an easy read, but it also felt like mm-hmm. it ended. And and I thought the, the resolution yeah. between Sa- Sa- Sabe and Padme, that last conversation they have, was great. But it didn't feel like a three-act story, and it didn't feel like everything was resolved. Mm-hmm. It just felt like, okay, the book ended. Because... I pointed out I love yeah. that scene with Palpatine. We don't see the follow up. You know, maybe that'll happen in Brotherhood, considering how this review has been going. But it, it just <laughs> felt like okay, these stories they begin and they end, but it doesn't feel like the narrative finished. It feels like they're, they're saving it for another story, or this is just how those stories are going to end. But that confuses me because it feels like this was written as the conclusion of this trilogy. I'm not sure Mm -hmm. if we're going to get a fourth one. I'm not sure what that would entail. Maybe one of the handmaidens after Padme's death? Because I know Sabe shows up in the the Vader comics. Vader comics, yeah. Which I am very excited to. I I just bought the first volume earlier this week. So I'm very excited. Wow. Enjoy that. Enjoy that. I'm very excited. But we don't know uh, many of their other stories. Like we don't know what happens with Dorme. We don't know what happens with Sasha and Yane. As far as I'm aware, I know she has some political uh, aspirations after Padme's death, and then Panaka gets inserted as the mm-hmm. moth of, of, of Naboo. I, I know about that. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember what that was from. Was that was that Queen's Peril or was that Queen's Shadow? Or was that something else entirely? I think that might have been something else. Or was that the? Va- I'm not sure. That might have been one of the comics. Yeah. Um. But I know. I think. Yeah. When I, I was doing so. my research, I remember seeing that because I was like, okay. What am I missing here? And then I saw that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing I just want how we pointed out that the handmaids really, aside from Sabe, don't have much to do. Is like you said mm-hmm. they showed up or they were at least talked about at the beginning like we she mentions one of them became a either an artist or a singer i don't remember what it was but mm-hmm. but then that, that was yes. all we heard from her for this entire book mm-hmm. which i thought was yeah a bit of a shame and we did get a lot more dorme in this book which i liked but i feel like if she had her own chapter in her perspective i would have loved that because we got like we said padme had her stuff anakin had his stuff Palpatine had a couple chapters. Bail Organa had a couple chapters. Mm-hmm. If the other, like Dorme and some of the other handmaidens, if if we just got to see what they were doing, how brief it could have been, I think that mm-hmm. would have added more. And, and I know we are saying, well, they didn't get to do enough. So I don't know if that would have made it better or worse of having them show up and then not show up again. But I, I just feel like it did them a disservice of if they're going to be such focal characters or at least be a part of this ensemble cast for the rest of the trilogy Mm -hmm. for them to be sidelined in what could be and very likely is the last in this queen's trilogy is a little Mm -hmm. disappointing especially if i was someone that really enjoyed say yane's character in the first two queen's books and then just seeing them Mm -hmm. be mentioned at the very beginning and then and mentioning how that they're they're adopting a bunch of or fostering a bunch of kids now, but that's all we got, mm-hmm. which I feel is a little upsetting. And I wish that 
they ek could have found a, a place to insert them into the narrative and, and give them something a bit more to do to where it just didn't feel like they were just lost in the background in this one yeah i i 100 agree with you i think there's no way to where you could have added them more into the story and for it to be bad to make the story worse i i think that no matter what you did I mean, maybe you would have to like restructure it in some places and maybe we get to see what they're up to now, like kind of throughout the book, uh, kind of space it out a little bit. I think it totally would have worked and it, it would have made sense because we had seen them in the previous two books. And it's not like so I, I was also like a little bit get an introdu- a whole new introduction for a new character. Like right. We, we would have known who they are already and. Yes, their previous stories. So you, you would have had to save all that exposition. So you're right. Even if it was yeah. like Padme, Typho, and one of the other handmaidens, one on the undercover mission, they could mm-hmm. have done that. They could have just given them something else to do. And I feel that is one of the the missteps with this book is the fact that those characters really didn't have much to do. Uh, I want to talk about Padme's mission itself, and then I want to talk about. I think my big complaint with this book, but okay. the mission itself, I, I, I liked it. I mean, it became clear that no one on the Wookiee ship kind of like bought that they were uh, mercenaries or whatever they were supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Like, it was clear that they knew something was up right away. But right. one, I, I loved the attention to detail that EK brought to this ship and, and making it like mm-hmm. oh you know Pam is like I, I gotta go out and get one of these ships for myself after this uh but i just love yeah. whenever authors get to include wookie characters and add more to that culture i very much like that and i liked how the droid who ends up being someone that worked for the the nemoidian that hired him was played mm-hmm. for laughs but his deception was not treated as like a big twist like oh he's the oh, yeah. villain it's just, oh, he's this, mm-hmm. but this is a good guy. Don't worry, you're fine. Because it kind yeah, of yeah. made it seem like it was going to be that with one of the like early teases in the chapters. And then mm-hmm. it ended up being a red herring, which I liked. And I, I thought the whole crew was enjoyable. And then, like I said, the, the, the mission where she helped the Jedi General and Styx, I loved all of yeah. that. That was one of my favorite parts of the whole book. And getting to see Padme in action... Uh, not only like what we were used to, but uh, EK writes mm-hmm. in this one how Padme likes to or prefers combat with a vibroblade, which I really like because we have not seen that at all, I believe. Definitely at not all. the prequels, no. and I don't even think in the Clone Wars. <laughs> so that was, was very yeah. nice, especially because Clone Wars is like my supplementary material that really made me love. And I've always loved Padme. I was a, a prequel kid, so Padme was always mm-hmm. one of my favorites, and... Clone Wars really helped her, and that's why when these books were announced, because they they were announced at a point where like Padme is loved now, but especially during the early days of the sequel trilogy in the Disney era, especially by Mm -hmm. Disney itself, Padme was just neglected, not only in marketing, but Mm -hmm. like conversation and and, and importance of they would have all these women of star wars tributes and padme would be left off of some of them entirely which is insane to think that the lead character of or the lead female of an entire trilogy was thought of that way but Mm -hmm. again that's more of not only the internet's journey and the fandom's journey of of slowly embracing the prequels over time but also lucas yeah because when lucasfilm first acquired i mean when disney sorry first acquired lucasfilm they were trying to avoid the prequels as much as they could because stop you if you stop me if you've heard this one but new star wars movies came out and they were called the worst thing ever by a, a large portion of, of the community or not, or a loud portion of the community and that oh it ruined mm-hmm. the franchise they'll never be the same again I, sounds a bit familiar and I, i've lived through both of those yeah. eras and it's, it's not <laughs> absolutely um but even i remember my own personal experience of when i went to celebration orlando in 2017 of seeing prequel stuff 
like out in the open and being talked about, mm-hmm. I was like, whoa, this is, yeah. I was, it, it was so cool at that point and so refreshing because at that point it was all original trilogy, original trilogy, original trilogy. And then slowly mm-hmm. and more slowly we're seeing more and more. And now it's like, they're promoting it and they're talking about it as much as any of the other stuff because now a lot of the voices in the fandom have switched from the older generation to now this more younger generation is taking the spotlight. And and we're seeing this talked about a lot in a lot of the pre-release uh, press for the Obi-Wan series of Ewan and Hayden constantly Ex- talking about this, which I love. Yes. So I'm hoping... I, I, I- Again, it goes back to... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just saying it it was very glad to slowly see Padme get re-embraced by the fandom like we're seeing now in real time with Ewan and Hayden. And that's why I'm really hoping that Natalie Portman can show up again in something at some point somehow. So, because... Yeah. I, I I think that would just be a really wonderful thing to see, but... I love the fact that Padme has had more and more stories over the years dedicated to her, and I hope it doesn't stop, Mm -hmm. because I think she's one of the most compelling and instantly likable and rootable female protagonists that we have in this entire franchise, Mm -hmm. and I I just, I can't get enough of her character, to be completely honest, so whether or not these are- And I don't think we've scratched the surface. No, we have not. Definitely not. Especially because there's some stuff you can tell- before phantom menace and then there's also Mm -hmm. that 10 year gap in between episode one and two that was touched upon in queen's shadow but that was Mm -hmm. only a little bit of time there's so much more and it's like oh you'll run out of clone war stories eventually i mean not really not really it's It's three years it's a huge three years is a long time you can tell so many stories it's again the the sandbox is wide open to play with for right. all of these characters, and I won't complain if we get more of them. So, th- th- those are my thoughts there. Uh, now, before right. I get into my hit my, me my, hit me with this. <laughs> oh, my least favorite part of the book. <laughs> yeah, hit me with your complaint. I've been waiting. <laughs> I, I I have talked about how I enjoyed how Ek wrote some characters. And I mentioned right. how I didn't like how she wrote others. I did not mm-hmm. care for how E.K. Johnston wrote Anakin Skywalker in this book. I I thought, especially in the scene where Anakin discovers Sabe in Padme's apartment. Anakin, that was not Anakin Skywalker. That was, that was, she made him come off so predatory which I, I i did not i just don't think that's anakin like he's standoffish at points and he has his anger issues but he's never like in the way that she kind of wrote it to where anakin was like oh anakin doesn't like any of these people he kind of likes bail organa kind of and like he didn't like sabe but you know He'll, he'll he'll pretend. I just don't feel like that's his character. I especially feel if he realized right away that Sabe is someone that he knows means the world to Padme. That would be enough mm-hmm. there to where Anakin would embrace her with open arms. Because that's who he was before he turned to the dark side. He was a man whose emotions were so real and so important where it wasn't supposed to be as a Jedi and that's what led to him getting manipulated and fell to the dark side because Palpatine took away everything that he loved I just I just I get what she was going for there but I feel like the the weird having to have it so oh Padme got married but (laughs) her, her best friend doesn't like her her husband and her husband doesn't like her best friend. I don't know. I I I just I wouldn't well, have, I wouldn't have done that honestly. See, I, and for me, 
I know you said that you understand where she was going. I had no idea where she was going with I that mean, entire. I was um, I was just being nice here because Sabe's whole story yeah. in this one was I don't really like any of these people, but I'm going to pretend to do it because I'm yeah you know pretending to be Padme here. I just and again Anakin Anakin's character has been worked on as much as I mean way more than Padme's character has obviously, but especially in the clone wars which i know this is not a clone wars episode but the the development of of anakin through the clone wars series just makes him more relatable and i think really kind of he's more than just the whiny kid in episode two and i felt like anakin's portrayal in queen's hope was just kind of a step backwards like you said he 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 was just very overly confrontational like and i'm, I'm yes. thinking about specifically the scene at the jedi temple where sabe is obviously pretending to be padme after they kind of had that interaction of just like where's padme you're not padme where's padme to where he's just like he's nice one second and like trying to make up for how he was the previous and, night and, that felt and like then Anakin it takes one me. thing and, it, it, and he goes off again yeah, exactly was, it did it did not I and know. he just goes back to this weird guy like just not anakin skywalker yeah, it, it takes um, a lot for anakin and to so like, i 100 percent agree with you on that yeah. it, it takes a lot for him to fall into that rage of for example when his mother was abducted by the tuscans and when padme was threatened and none of that was happening mm-hmm. here sabe kind of put two and two together that the two were married, which I thought was established in the earlier scene. And that was another thing is like Sabe's, I loved her story of imper- like having to take on the role of, of portraying Padme in a new role. And eventually by the end of the book, realizing that she doesn't want to do this anymore. And she wants to, she needs her own life. She needs to yeah. get out of the queen's shadow. I get what you're doing there. EK. But, <laughs> I did not like her subplot of she just seems so jealous throughout the whole book, whether it be the mm-hmm. fact that Padme is keeping stuff from her or the fact that she or feels, that she's with Anakin yeah, replaced by Anakin like she like that should be me. I just mm-hmm. I thought I, I did not feel it, it is a character that I've really enjoyed and would like to see more of not only in literature form but eventually in one of the series whether that be animation or live action i think that would be great to see get kira knightley back in there but (laughs) yep i just if this just did not work for me and i don't want like again the oh that's not the character i know but it just it just did not well it didn't feel like she was writing anakin it felt like she was writing like a sociopath and I just yeah. don't feel like that's Anakin. The I will say this. The scenes on Naboo with Anakin and Padme, I quite enjoyed. I thought those were mm-hmm. good. And For sure. I liked their little side mission that they have at the beginning of the book, which I thought that was going to be the whole book. Uh, mm-hmm. Save for a couple portions where, like I mentioned, where I think there was a scene where E.K. was like, oh, Anakin hates all politicians except Padme, but he kind of tolerates a couple of them, like Bill Organa. And I'm like, well, I also know that they work together a lot in the Clone Wars series, and there seemed to be no animosity there. Just because Anakin well, hates how the Republic politics work, I don't think he hates certain people. And Bail Organa has always been treated as one of the good guys. And I again, there were certain things that went against his character. And, and other stuff... Uh, of mm-hmm. conversations that Padme and Sabe had specifically where Sabe kind of tries to, or at least Sabe or Ike try to insinuate that like Anakin forced Padme into the, the marriage, which again, I just think is a complete misunderstanding of their relationship. And I just feel the way that Ike episode wrote, two. Yeah. Episode two, who was the one who instigated and said, I love you first. Padme. Or I'm deeply in love with you. Padme like, did. Anakin instigated so, the kiss on the boo, but 
Yes, Padme was the but one, Padme literally Anakin was the one that said, "I thought we were the ones that agreed not to fall in love." Yes, it's very and... clearly a mutual thing. Say what you will about the dialogue in that movie, but yes. Anakin and Padme's story is the two of them slowly realizing that they are deeply in love with each other, and cannot live without each other. Mm-hmm. And for them, right? To, and it's and always nice even for- in Episode Three, we see that. That Obi Wan tells Anakin, like, today is your day with the politicians. Now, why would he say that if he doesn't like them and only likes Padme and can barely tolerate a couple? Like, yeah, that doesn't that doesn't make any sense to me that doesn't either. Make any sense. So, so it's just one of those things where I was like, ah, uh, Ek, you mm, you kind of missed missed it to a little me, bit. It feels like Ek took the the meadow picnic scene in attack of the clones and made turn that it up 11. Her, yeah. yeah. Turned it up to 11 and made that her entire way of writing Anakin in this book. And yes, mm-hmm. it does take place. The, the first part of the book is before the end of attack of the clones. So we do right. see a more raw, more immature Anakin, but I still mm-hmm. feel like that's just not who Anakin is. Cause we've had plenty of, pre-attack of the clones anakin stories and the kid has his issues but he's Mm -hmm. always been a respectful stand-up guy and the Mm -hmm. way that even like oh he had this weird aura about him and i'm like this i don't know it just wasn't as someone that loves (laughs) anakin skywalker i just i don't know i was not a fan of how he was written in this one and whether that just be because EK felt that she needed to write him in a certain way to make Sabe's realization at the end have more weight. But again, mm-hmm. I don't think that was needed because you can still no, have I... Anakin be like, she can be like, oh no, I really like Anakin. And that's why this yeah. hurts even more because he's, because he's a stand up guy. And yes. it, it, it would make it hurt that much more. And it would make her realization that she needs to be on her own have even mm-hmm. more of an impact than it already did. So again, yeah. I just think that was a complete swing and a miss on her part. I really liked how she wrote a lot of characters in this one. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, if one of your selling points is this is an Anakin and Padme story, and one of them is written like he's Charles Manson and not Anakin Skywalker, right? It, it's it's a little upsetting. Especially because this is the portion of Anakin's story where he develops into the the well rounded and, and respected Jedi that he is at the beginning of Revenge of the Sith. And then when he's clouded by all of this stuff. That just didn't again for me. <laughs> again, if you want a great Anakin Skywalker portrayal, yep. Brotherhood. <laughs> Mike Chen, please. Mike save Mike us. Chen just he's got it. He's got it. So, uh, if, if there's any other big things that stood out for you about this book before we kind of get into the ending resolution and, and, and what we thought about mm-hmm. that, feel free, because we, we've been going a bit at this point. So, I just want to know what other big things work for you, what stuff maybe didn't. Leave it all on the table here. Yeah, I, I just think, again, I, my favorite species in the star wars universe are wookies and so anytime we have a wookie sighting that for me is gold and i love it and i think she did a really good job in in making sure that they got again a a good example of what wookies across the galaxy really are like i love um the kind of twist of the of the i'm i'm sorry i'm gonna butcher this name but the Naomians, or I, I'm sorry, I butchered that. I believe it's Nemoidians. Um, Nemoidians, yes. I I love again because it connects to brotherhood. But I, I again, I love the idea of and the conversation that I think is being had in this book and in Brotherhood of people who who are the same as other people that you know that may not have been. A, a good example of the people group as a whole. We need to be careful in how we have our prejudices and how we judge people based on the actions of others. And 
I think this was a really, really good conversation starter of not all of them are the exact same. These people th- that, you know, Newt Gunray and, and the, and Lot Dodd, because we don't like him, they do not really represent these people. Yeah. Uh, there are people who are of, trying to do, yes. Yeah, it's a great story of not learning to not represent an entire culture of people by the actions right. of a very select few, which I really right. Like. And so to start that conversation, I I thought that it was really, really good. And to me was... I don't want to say saving grace because I, I did enjoy the book a lot, but it was one of those things that I'm just like, this is a powerful message that more people need to, to read and to actually live out in their personal lives of, of just let us have conversations with one another uh, who are different and may disagree on some things, especially, especially in the Star Wars community of yes you may not like the sequel trilogy but guess what little girls love ray skywalker and just because you're not a fan doesn't of her doesn't mean that you get to bash people who do like her because they mean something to her and so i thought that that part was a great great conversation starter for what we're gonna get and what we've gotten in brotherhood as I've as I've gotten older, I've just I don't understand the thought process and the the concept of bashing others for enjoying something that you don't personally like. Like there's a lot yeah. of stuff that I am not a fan of, but I will never be like, "What is wrong with you?" Because yeah, because I'm just like, and this is this clearly this is work for someone, <laughs> and and this is like um. Because again, I, I follow you on TikTok. Yeah. Like, I enjoyed the Secrets Sorry. of Dumbledore. Like, I'm a huge Secrets of Dumbledore fan, um, and I know that like not everybody is is as big of a fan as I am. But never once had I mean, has anybody told me of just like, man, what kind of a Harry Potter fan are you yeah. to actually like this? You yeah, know, um, that, that was why are we like that? That in was Star such Wars? a hard thing to do because I was like, see, <laughs> I. I See, I, here's the thing: is I actually liked that movie a lot more than I think I I came across in that one. I was just mm-hmm. like, there was stuff that also <laughs> didn't work, and I just I I can't right. tell you how much I disliked Times of Grindelwald. That movie was my like. See, and I love that movie. I love that movie. I, I love I that, movie. that movie so much. But that's okay. It's perfect. But then I was also yeah. wrestling with the. I don't feel comfortable making this review in the first place because fuck J.K. Rowling. So I was like, yes. it, it was it was a mixture of that. Uh, but again, you can have all those conversations in the world, and I am totally fine with civil debates and conversations like we're having here with this book. It's when yes. you go, it's not valid because you just like something I don't. Well, then mm-hmm. what is the point of opinions then? If everyone is yeah. going to like the exact same stuff, what's the point of the world? Like, mm-hmm. then there's no individuality and. Again, let people like what they like and let people celebrate what they enjoy. And that's what I've kind of made into my whole goal in my message here with any of the stuff mm-hmm. that I write or make or create is mm-hmm. I want to spread that positivity or at least trying to spin whether I have my critiques and I just went on a whole yes. tirade about how <laughs> I, I disliked Anakin and while I was while you were talking about that, I was thinking about how much I loved the sister scene and how supportive mm-hmm. Anakin was and how he mentioned that the Jedi are all about finding identity and belonging, which made the mm-hmm. scene with Sabe at the temple even worse in hindsight. But again, <sighs> it's just let people enjoy what they like. And if someone right. loves a movie or a book that you don't, don't feel the need to just no. This is terrible. Yeah. How can you even? I just don't. I, I, I. It's another story for another day. For another, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I very much agree with with everything you said. So when we get to the the end, Padme returns from mm-hmm. her mission. Sabe has a conversation. She kind of lays it all on the line. The whole book, 
Padme was kind of talking about, well, we, we saw scenes of how she was like, oh, I can't wait to tell Sabe all this, but the timing's not right. I really wish I could mm-hmm. tell Sabe, but the timing's not right. So when Padme comes in and Sabe starts talking to her and she goes, all right, so I saw your husband. And then they have this whole conversation. <laughs> Yikes. And it leads to <laughs> Sabe kind of, and, and I liked how this, this was written the scene of how it kind Mm -hmm. of just all started spilling out and she didn't really like have any control of it she just laid everything on the table and said it's i need to forge my own path i need to get out of your shadow i need to go back to tatooine do my own thing i just cannot be you anymore because i am just not that person anymore the senator and and the personal padme with this the secret marriage his it's just not it's just not me and this scene i i really enjoyed because it gave us a couple uh explanations here number one why wasn't sabe present in the clone wars series at all and why weren't the handmaidens in revenge of the sith there you go she was off on tatooine Number two, it gives her mm-hmm. arcs in the the comics more weight and any future stories more weight because we get to see yep. this mm-hmm. potentially could have been the last conversation the two of them ever had before Padme died. And I would hope that that's not the case. But if it is, it makes it all right. the more tragic that this was their last moment together. And, and she really wrote it as the conversation was, I thought, so powerful. And then how the two she said oh they spent the the rest of the night together like they were kids back on Naboo again and I, I thought that was so mm-hmm. it, it was a perfect writing of of how to do a, a goodbye scene of having all these emotions of right this inclusion and then just having that nostalgia for the past knowing that the, the, you know we're never gonna have these moments again I thought really hit me and and you're for a, uh, mm-hmm. a young adult novel writer i i think that's a really great skill to have and this was just straight out of a ya like any great ya novel and i, I thought it was a really nice conclusion mm-hmm. to the book and having uh sabe go back to tatooine and, and continuing her journey with the the white sons i i thought that whole stuff regardless of my critiques earlier <laughs> I thought it wrapped up really yeah. nicely and I was very impressed. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think again, I'm all about messages here and I think the Sabe Padme scene was crucial. I think to, to people who are, who are growing up and getting out in the world and really sending this message are like, listen, the friends that you have had for the past couple of years, your relationship might not be the same ever again. And that's okay. Um, you've changed, you're going to change, you're going to experience life in a whole new way, and you can't always take your friends with you. But that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy those moments that you have together like you used to. It just won't happen as often or as frequent as you as you may desire to. But that's okay because they're doing what they love and you're doing what you love. And one day you can come back together and just enjoy each other's company one more time and that's a beautiful thing i very much agree with you uh i i really liked the ending and i i love having these two go in their own directions and Mm -hmm. and really making this is the final culmination of padme going from i mean not padme sabe going from a handmaid a duplicate to her own character which I love. Exactly. And that's why I'm hoping that we do get more, whether or not we get another Queen's book in particular, but we do get more handmaiden stories in the future. I think that would be great because I mm-hmm. think that's what I really do hope we get some type of post revenge of the Sith story with them because them reacting to Padme's death and having to go forge their own paths all just sounds incredibly interesting to me. And, and to see where they go in the yeah. galaxy and what routes they take in life, I would love to see for every single one of them, if I'm being completely honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think you could, There's like you said, there's plenty of, of great stories to tell. I think 
getting their reactions to Padme's death and everything that happens afterwards, it's going to hurt a lot for us to oh, read that. Uh, yeah. But I think it it is a great, great way to continue telling the stories because I think like you, I'm not done with these characters yet. No. I want more. No. I mean, it was a, it was a conclusion of a trilogy, but... I, it didn't feel like any of their stories were done, which could be a complaint. Mm -hmm. You could put that against the book. But for Star Wars, I feel like you can't do that because the universe is so expansive and you never know yes. when these characters can show up in something else, whether that be a novel, mm -hmm. a comic, a book, a TV, or I mean, a game, a TV show, anything. Right. And... Again, mm -hmm. I would I would really like to see more from these characters, and I mean, if any of them join the rebellion, if any of them join the empire, I would love to see mm -hmm. where they go. And everything I have seen with Sabe's story in the original trilogy era, I've loved, and I want to see the other great. handmaidens get that spotlight as well. I think that mm -hmm. would be very nice to see, especially because. We, we kind of know where some of them are going right now with fighting against slavery. I think seeing more of that and seeing them yes. work with the Lars family on Tatooine and other uh, forces around the galaxy, I think would be really great to see in something in the future. And I hope we get the opportunity to do so. So, yeah, I think to wrap things up, Queen's Hope to me, it, I wouldn't put it in like a top five list of my favorite Star Wars novels or anything. And I, I think... When I go into this one and, and when I get around to rereading Queen's Shadow and finishing Queen's Peril, and once I finish Brotherhood, mm -hmm. I think my opinion of the book is going to change for the better, most likely. Because I mm -hmm. think it is... I, I think the conclusion that we've come to that this is a great companion piece to Brotherhood is more and more apparent mm -hmm. the more that we've gone on in the hour or so that we've been talking of these books really are made right. for each other. And I, I think in my case, reading them back to back is going to be an absolute treat. I didn't care for certain ways. Some characters were written. I didn't care for certain plot lines that I mm -hmm. felt weren't given enough time or just weren't as interesting as Padme's story or Sabe's story. But overall, I thought it was a very enjoyable book. It was a very easy read for me. It, only took a, a few sittings mm -hmm. it flew by the interludes i thought were the best part of the book and i just i had a good time with it and certain things connected with me more than i was expecting them to and that's always a treat when you come into something and your your expectation is i'm gonna get this nice padme and anakin story but the thing i come out with at the end is something more than that which i i really appreciated uh, any final thoughts before we wrap things up? I think if I would have to describe this trilogy, I think it would just be, you know, like you said, like these books are not going to be in my top five. Uh, but I think when we talk about overall story, I think it really just highlights and adds a couple more layers into Padme's character and who she is, uh, gives her the recognition she deserves in the Star Wars universe. And I still think though that that there could have been more, you know, to I these agree. stories. I agree. Uh and that it's unfortunate that we didn't get more, but also I'm glad for what we got. Uh so I'm thankful for that. Um and I hope that we get to see some of these characters again really, really soon in some other stories. I definitely agree with that. One last thing I want to say is, is these are young adult stories and they have two great mm -hmm. themes of growing up and forging mm -hmm. your own path and your own identity and going down a direction that you feel is best for you. And I think those are great themes to have throughout all three of the books. And it was definitely on display here in Queen's Hope. David, I want to thank you for, for coming on. This was an absolute great episode that we had here i thought we were only going to go about a half hour we went almost double that so <laughs> or no we yeah hour 20 actually i don't know what i'm talking about so thank you i really enjoyed our, our, our conversations uh definitely want to have you on again in the future uh where can the good people find you and uh 
see more of what you have to say about the, the galaxy far, far away. Well, you could uh, see me on Instagram at, at the SW historian. And I think it's the same thing on Twitter as well. Uh, and I have my own podcast called the Star Wars Historian Show. Uh, we're available everywhere you can listen to podcasts. It's me and my best friend, Luke, just talking about Star Wars Galaxy that we love. That's perfect. And you can follow me on Twitter at Starlight Andrew. You can also find me on TikTok. Same place at Starlight Andrew. Uh, I actually opened up a Goodreads account as well. You can follow me there at Starlight Andrew. I'm going to be logging all of my Star Wars books there and having a couple quick thoughts on those as well. Uh, you can follow the podcast at For the Repub Pod on Twitter and at For the Republic Pod on Instagram. You can thank Twitter not having enough characters uh, for that one. <laughs> uh, as for the show itself, we're hopefully going to be back for one more episode before Celebration to talk about Kenobi, uh, not Kenobi, Celebration uh, preview and the next arc of the Clone Wars, which is going to be the Domino Squadron arc, which I cannot wait for. Uh, so thank you once again, David, for joining us. And as always, thank you. Thank you so much. And as always, may the Force be with you. Always.